If I asked you to pick the worst desktop CPU to use in a home server, there's a good chance you'd land on something like this from AMD's FX series. In fact, I know you would because, well, I asked. These FX CPUs weren't known for being, well, good, but the entire lineup was unlocked, which meant you could overclock the heck out of these to get some pretty decent gaming performance on a budget. But that overclocking potential also gave them the reputation of being very hot and power hungry. And I would know. This FX 6300 was the same CPU I had in my very first gaming PC back in college. And I have very vivid memories of a box fan leaning up against the side of my case, trying to keep everything cool while I was drenched in sweat, trying to finally hit diamond in Rocket League. Good times. If these CPUs were well known for drawing a ton of power, putting them in a home server that's running 24 seven probably doesn't seem like a good idea. But the unlocked features of these CPUs aren't just limited to overclocking. What if instead you could undervolt these to the point to where these systems are essentially just sipping power? Okay, maybe not just sipping power, but it is true that these systems have a lot more tweakability than other options. And maybe with the right settings, this could actually be a decent option for a home server. Okay, before we get too far into this, why? Why make this video at all? Well, really, I have two reasons. First of all, I thought it was a silly idea and would be a lot of fun. Secondly, I don't think it's crazy to think that someone watching this video might have an old FX series system tucked in a closet or something, just collecting dust. And maybe the owner of that system is starting to get interested in self-hosting. It's also not completely unlikely that you could find some similar systems to this being sold for next to nothing. In fact, in my very first video on this channel, I talked about some PCs that I found that were going to be thrown in the trash. And one of those had in it, I believe, an FX 6100. So if you happen to already own one of these or you find one in the trash, could it actually be used as a home server or is the power and performance just so bad that it's not worth it? Well, that's what I wanted to find out in this video. Maybe it is possible to lower the power draw on a system like this so that you don't see as big of an impact on your power bill. Now, speaking of power and impact, imagine there's a great segue here to this Genshin Impact themed accessories kit from today's sponsor, Ugreen. Ugreen and Genshin Impact have teamed up to create this stunning Kanish themed fast charging adventure kit, featuring the five star limited edition character Kanish, and of course, Ahau as well. Whether you're keeping your phone, laptop, or even a Steam Deck charged up for long gaming sessions, this set has you covered. The Nexode power bank delivers up to 100 watts of fast charging on a single port, or 130 watts across both. And with the 20,000 milliamp hour capacity, you can keep all your devices powered on the go. It even has a TFT smart display, so you can see the charging stats in real time. The Nexode 65 watt charger can charge up to three devices at once, perfect for powering up your phone, tablet, and laptop simultaneously. And for those who prefer wireless charging, the Magflow wireless charger supports Qi 2 certified 15 watt fast charging, ideal for your iPhone, AirPods, or smartwatch, all in a foldable travel friendly design. Everything comes in a Kanish themed design, complete with aha boot animations on the power bank and a matching cable tie organizer. It's the perfect solution for any diehard Genshin fans to keep all of their devices charged on the go. Right now, you can save up to 30% and get signed up for Ugreen's massive giveaway. All you have to do is use my links down in the description. While the FX lineup includes four and eight core options, I opted for the six core FX6300, mostly just because I thought it would be fun to revisit my old friend after about a decade. And now I say six core CPU, but well, there was a lot of controversy with the pile driver and bulldozer architectures about how cores were defined and whether two integer units were considered two different cores if they shared the same floating point unit and cache. Uh, there was a whole lawsuit and there's a lot of information out there on that. This video is not going to cover that. For the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to call this a six core CPU. The FX 6300 has a clock speed of 3.5 gigahertz and turbo frequencies of up to 4.1 gigahertz. But as I said earlier, it has an unlocked multiplier and most motherboards you would get for these CPUs have all the options and tweaking you need to do some overclocking. Now there was a time, especially after Ryzen was introduced and started to dominate the gaming market, where I could hop on Facebook Marketplace and I feel like I'd have people trying to pay me to take their old FX systems. But when I hopped on Marketplace, I couldn't really find anything. So instead, I hopped on eBay and picked up this combo with an FX6300, four gigabytes of DDR3, and an ASRock 970M motherboard. The 990X and 990FX chipsets have some more features and are better for overclocking, but I figured since if anything were going to be undervolting or underclocking, this 970M Pro would be just fine and probably save me a little bit of money. Not that I was like really deal hunting or anything because, well, I still paid a little over $40 for this bundle. For testing, I just picked up this tiny little AM3 compatible cooler, which yeah, it is small, but the goal was to use as little power as possible, so it should work just fine. 
to power everything, I used the only power supply I had readily available, which was the Zalman GigaChad 500 watt I used back in the Home Lab Challenge Season 2. And yeah, it's not the best, it's only an 80 plus bronze unit, but it's what I had. None of the FX series CPUs have integrated graphics, so I grabbed this Quadro P620 as I figured it wouldn't draw a ton of extra power, and later on we could even use it for some transcoding if we wanted to. And lastly, I grabbed a crucial 240GB SATA SSD. Everything powered on without issue, and I got Debian 12 installed for some testing. But before actually installing anything and trying to use this as a home server, I wanted to see just how much I could bring the power draw down with some tweaking, undervolting, and maybe even some underclocking. I started out with just the default settings in the BIOS, and when just sitting idle in Debian, the total system was drawing around 57 watts. To help bring that down a little bit, I ran PowerTop Autotune, as well as the Auto ASPM script from Wolfgang's channel, and that brought the total system idle power draw down to 54 watts. So yeah, not great. But idle power draw isn't everything, and to get an idea of what this system would actually draw when it was under load, I ran stress within S2E. This isn't a benchmark or anything, but it does give us a baseline to compare to once we start doing some tweaking. And with the default configuration, the system was drawing 134 watts while running stress. To start things off, I tried bringing power draw down by tweaking settings that wouldn't really affect performance, and also didn't get into any undervolting or anything like that. Cool and Quiet was already enabled, which was good, but I could also turn on the settings Enhanced Halt State and Core C6 to enable more C states. I also changed the CPU fan from just being full on to being on a curve. And this drastically brought idle power draw down to just 43 watts. It also dropped down when running stress to just 126 watts. And you might be thinking, well, sure, it dropped down, but did you lose some performance when enabling those settings? And no, I actually ran Geekbench with the original default configuration, as well as my slightly tweaked configuration, and the performance didn't change. If anything, it actually went up just a little bit. Now, that's probably just within the margin of error, but still, basically the same performance while using a lot less power, and we hadn't even gotten to the good stuff yet. Next, I wanted to try undervolting the CPU while retaining the same clock speed. Now, I had seen in some old forum posts where people were able to pretty drastically undervolt these while keeping the same stock frequencies. I was feeling pretty lucky, so I immediately dropped VCore down to just 1.225 volts. I ran stress NG to try to test for stability, and I'll be honest, I only ran it for a few minutes because I was getting really excited to see how much this would affect our power draw. And yeah, it actually only dropped the power draw down by one more watt to 42 watts. And that was disappointing. This is where I missed something that was probably pretty obvious. When sitting at idle, the AMD cool and quiet feature was going to be automatically adjusting frequencies and voltages to reduce power draw. This became even more obvious when later on I installed Windows so I could run hardware info. So yeah, undervolting the CPU really doesn't help when at idle, but it did help when we were actually putting the CPU under load. When running stress again, the total system power dropped down to just 107 watts. That's 15% better than the tweaked settings and 20% better than the default settings. And once again, we weren't actually losing any performance. But to see if I could actually get the idle power draw to go down, I decided to move on to adjusting memory voltage. As it turns out, undervolting the memory is actually possible, because, well, it actually already was undervolted. I have no idea what the spec of this unlabeled stick of DDR3 is, but apparently it had an XMP profile that already brought down the standard 1.5 volts of DDR3 to just 1.35 volts. Now, I figured the voltage on this pre-tuned XMP profile was probably as low as it was really going to go, but I had another idea. What if I swapped that standard DDR3 stick with some DDR3L? And yeah, DDR3L already runs at 1.35 volts, so that wouldn't be lowering the voltage any, but since DDR3L is designed to run at lower voltages, I kind of thought maybe that'd give us a little bit more headroom so we could go even lower. Now, I'm not gonna talk about every single step, so to skip ahead, I did get the memory voltage down to 1.25 volts, and I even brought the CPU voltage down just a little bit more to 1.2 volts, and undervolted the north bridge from 1.2 volts to 1.1. And after making sure all that was relatively stable, that brought the idle power draw down by another half watt, maybe. But hey, once again, when running stress, I was able to drop the system power draw from 107 to 102. I still wanted to get that idle power draw down though, so in a desperate attempt to maybe shave off another half watt or so, I disabled everything I could think of, like the internal audio, the USB 3 controller, and even the front panel LEDs that I didn't even have plugged in because I was desperate. And after doing all that, I was actually able to break the 40 watt mark, getting down to around 39.8 watts or so. That's actually a 30% decrease from where we first started, and once again, I ran Geekbench and we were still getting the same performance. Now, I know some of you are probably already asking why I didn't remove the GPU, because, well, if we're using this as a server, we don't really need the display adapter, especially if we're not needing it for any hardware-accelerated transcoding. 
Based on some testing from a previous video, I would assume that at most we would be saving around 10 more watts at idle by not having the P620. But the problem is whenever I tried to remove it from the system, it just wouldn't post, and I couldn't find any settings in the BIOS to remedy that. Now there might be some other motherboards out there that do support a headless mode or some other setting, but for me it seemed like I was just stuck with the P620. If I was going to bring idle power draw down anymore, I felt like I needed to get drastic. Up until this point, I had managed to bring the power draw down without affecting the performance or functionality at all. Well, I guess unless you do need a USB 3 port. But if you are planning on using this as just a simple NAS or a backup server or something, you really don't need that much CPU performance. So my first thought was to cut down the CPU cores. Now earlier I briefly mentioned how these weren't always considered to be 6 core CPUs because, well, every two cores shared cache and a floating point unit, those were called like modules, and I actually found an option in the BIOS to keep one core per unit, which I figured basically meant one core per module, which meant I would only have three cores but I would still retain all of the floating point units and cache, which sounded like a really good idea. Except for the fact that it didn't do anything. Okay, so maybe it makes sense that by keeping all of the cache and FPUs and such, I'm really not bringing the power draw down any, so I decided to just go down to two cores, which I figured was going to be one module. And that also didn't do anything. Well, it did something, it brought the performance down because, yeah, we actually only did have two cores, but the idle power draw was still the same. In fact, it actually kind of went up a little bit. And honestly, I don't understand why this is the case. I would assume that if you went from three cores to one core, or six to two, however you want to look at it, the power would go down at least a little bit. But it didn't. So yeah, that's basically it. When it comes to the CPU, there's really only so much you can do to bring the power draw down. And it's not just the CPU that's drawing power. There's the memory, the chipset, the network controller, and other motherboard components, plus the GPU and SSD. Also, the power supply itself isn't going to be 100% efficient. And sadly, I don't have another power supply to test with, so it seems like that's just as good as it's going to get. I'm kidding, it actually got a lot better. First off, I totally forgot that I had this Corsair RM750E for a different project, which is probably a bit better than the GigaChad 5, I mean, it's definitely better because with my undervolted config from earlier, the power draw dropped by five watts, both at idle and when running stress. And it doesn't end there. When I actually started getting into testing this as a home server, one of the first things I did was replace the Nuvo drivers with the proprietary NVIDIA drivers, and this actually brought idle power draw down by another 5 watts, putting us at just 30 watts at idle. And yeah, 30 watts isn't nothing. It's actually twice as much as this Lenovo P330 with an i7-8700 when it was using the same Quadro P620. But still, that's almost 50% less compared to where we started when sitting at idle. And frankly, for someone who might already have a system like this sitting around, that's low enough to make you start considering your options. Sure, you could easily spend like 100 bucks and buy something much newer and more efficient, but how much more efficient does it need to be and for how long before you would actually break even? And what if you don't even need more performance? Could this FX6300 system still function decently well as a home server? Well, to find out, I first set up Portainer, where I ran Home Assistant with no issues, and also set up Crafty Controller to run a Minecraft server. The FX6300 actually handled running a vanilla Minecraft server decently well. There were a handful of times where terrain generation was noticeable, but for the most part, it was fairly smooth, and I imagine this would work just fine for a small server for some of your friends or your family. I also ran Jellyfin and had no issues getting NVENC working for some hardware accelerated transcoding. In fact, the P620 still holds up really well for this task, transcoding 10-bit HEVC with HDR tone mapping, no problem. While running Jellyfin, Home Assistant, and with that Minecraft server just running in the background, the system power draw only really increased by a watt or two. And even when Minecraft was generating terrain or FFmpeg was actively transcoding, it wasn't like the power draw was crazy, it typically just sort of jumped up to somewhere between 60 and 80 watts for a bit. Now I do have to say, for a system this old, power draw isn't going to be your only concern. For example, older motherboards like the one I have here only support SATA 2, and the FX series CPUs only support PCIe Gen 2. I had already been using a simple network share using just the gigabit connection, but to try to speed that up, I dropped in a 2.5 gig NIC to the buy one PCIe slot. However, I quickly realized that slot was capped to just PCIe Gen 1, so I was only getting about 250 megabytes per second when doing file transfers. So I moved that card down to a lower slot that did support PCIe Gen 2, 
but then I was actually bottlenecked by the SATA 2 port and was only getting around 270 megabytes per second. Now sure, if I was using this as a NAS that had multiple drives in an array, that would be better. And it would also be better if I was using something like ZFS where I had memory for caching. But it's good to keep in mind that with a motherboard like this, you might not have all of the newer protocols that you, or at least I have grown accustomed to. So surprisingly, this old FX system actually works as a home server. To be clear, it's not great, but it works. With a bit of tweaking and some upgrades, we managed to cut the power consumption nearly in half, all while keeping the system stable and functional. Whether you're looking for a simple file server, a Minecraft server for your family, or even something to run Plex or Jellyfin on, these older FX systems might actually get the job done. If you happen to stumble across one of these or already have one just collecting dust, it actually might not be as bad as you think. Well, at least after some tweaking. That being said, the tinkering and tweaking to try to get this optimized was actually pretty fun and could be a nice little weekend project. I really enjoyed this experiment, and I have to say, I think these little guys have maybe unfairly earned their reputation. When it comes to efficiency, at least if you're not overclocking and you do some tweaks, they're not as bad as you might think. But what do you think though? Let me know down in the comments, and maybe while you're down there, consider liking the video, subscribing, or maybe even becoming a raid member for as little as a dollar a month. You get early access to ad-free videos and some other cool perks. It's pretty neat. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching. Stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.